Hi, everybody. I know we still have a few people funneling in, but I wanted to start off by welcoming you to our webinar, Texas's House Bill 19 Policy, How to Comply and What This Means for You. I'm Molly Bidler, and I'm here with 10 Streets, Josh, Josh McAllister, and special guest, co-founder and CEO of Double Diamond Transport, Adam Blanchard. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to join us. We have some really great information to share today and resources you can take with you that will make the House Bill 19 requirements easier to understand and manage. Before we get started though, I wanted to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and sent to you within the next 24 hours. So don't worry if you get interrupted or have to jump off the call. We will also send over this presentation as a PDF so you can refer back to the information. Additionally, please submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation. You can do so using the text box under the question section in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Also, don't forget to look at the handout session in your panel. This is where you'll find information about the responsibilities drivers and carriers must meet to comply with House Bill 19, along with information about how 10th Street services can help you meet these requirements. Josh and Adam, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you guys and get the webinar started. Okay, thanks Molly, I appreciate it. Well everyone, I know that people are still funneling in. We appreciate you making time out of your busy day to hop on and just learn about uh, what we're seeing in the industry right now with just a little tidget space. And, um, you know, how some things like House Bill 19 and tort reform are coming into place to really uh, make impacts state by state. So first off, I want to thank you for joining us. Adam, thanks for coming as well. We appreciate you being here. If you are not a Texas-based carrier and you're on the call today, I also want to say thanks for joining us. Um, you know, we're going to be covering a lot of different topics and there's hope, right, that, you know, legislation like this would be put in place in states, uh, you know, near you and coming soon. So right now, tort reform is only in four to five states. There's some movement there. Um, and so there's a lot of room for growth in there. And we're going to be covering some ways to help protect your company in that regard as well. So, Adam, I appreciate you joining us. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and kind of the role you played in bringing House Bill 19 to the table. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and I appreciate all your listeners that are on. We, uh, uh, I started our, we started our trucking company, just a little bit about me. I practiced law for about four or five years and then uh, started our trucking company uh, back in 2014, one truck, one trailer. And uh, we run about 75 trucks and have about 250 trailers now maybe a little bit more than that. And, you know, over the years of just with my background and experience, um, and really from what my dad told me growing up was to be successful, you need to be involved in your community and your industry. And I would really encourage any of those that are on the call today to, to do the same because it's very important. And a lot of people feel like their voice isn't going to be heard, but I can, I can assure you that our cumulative invoice, our cumulative voices uh, can be heard because we saw that through our House Bill 19 uh, legislative effort last session and, you know, finding a, a good solution to the ever increasing uh, litigation environment that we're all dealing with. And I think House Bill 19 was a great first step in that effort. Uh, we actually had two bills. Uh, one of them died because the Texas Supreme Court came out and really uh, issued an opinion that was much stronger than our legislative our legislation on, on the medical billing practices. But uh, in terms of House Bill 19, you know, we in Texas are at a huge uh, disadvantage in our insurance renewals right now uh, coming into last session, given the litigation environment in Texas. Uh, I'm born and raised here, uh, third generation Texan, I think. I don't know. We've been around a long time and you know, that's not how we do business here in Texas. Uh, we, you are in a better position being in the surrounding states than Texas on our insurance renewals. Uh, given the current environment. So we, uh, through the Texas Tr Trucking Association, I serve on their board and, uh, and chairman of the Emerging Leaders Council, we teamed up with Texas for Lawsuit Reform to get some relief last session. And through the hard work of TLR and TXTA and the over 650 members of our Keep Texas Trucking Coalition uh, came together and got our bill passed. And you know, I was with my background as an attorney, but now being a trucking company owner was incredibly involved in the process. I helped with the bill drafting uh, testified in front of the House and Senate. Uh, we even got bipartisan support with 10 Democrats in the House voting for House Bill 19 and kind of breaking ranks with their Democratic caucus and, you know, through the leadership of the Speaker and Lieutenant Governor and Governor, got the bill signed. And and here we sit today with with a victory on our hands, but but certainly more to come. 
I think if we're going to continue to keep our economy strong, everybody knows that that the foundation of that is, is transportation, it's trucking, and we've got to make sure that, that this lawsuit abuse reform permeates throughout the entire country. And, and we believe here in Texas, we, we are proud in Texas that, you know, good policy comes out of Texas. And kind of like we see a lot of bad policy come out of California. And so we're here to continue to keep this fight up. We're, we're just getting started. So we'll come into next session, not only defending the, the gains that we had last session, but also continuing to advance uh, this initiative on a going forward basis to continue to make uh, Texas the best economy in, in the country and make sure the trucking is protected uh, to make sure our shelves are stocked and our, we got medicine and all the essential goods we need. Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge win for you guys, right? I know you worked on this a long time. I, I'm curious if I'm on the webinar right now and I'm in a different state and there is not tort reform in place and I'm, I'm obviously passionate about this, right? So what would be the best piece of advice you could give that person in terms of how do we get our voices together? How do we get movement on this? How do we take it to our state legislature? What, what would you kind of advise there? Well, I think I think the first thing that we all have to do is get involved within our state associations. I mean, tort reform in a lot of respects is an initiative that we're going to have to tackle at the state level. So it's going to be a state by state initiative. I think there are uh, some some things we can do at the federal level. I mean, I've advocated at both the state and federal level for many years on transportation issues. I think that a a good solution we can get at the federal level is allowing us to have these truck accident cases, especially dealing with interstate ca uh, cases, uh, have them heard in federal court instead of state courts. I think that's a, a good step we can take at the federal level. But uh, I think that as we see this continue to evolve over time with the deterioration of, of the lawsuit environments in all of our states, we have to do it through our state associations, whether it's the Texas Trucking Association like we have here in Texas or others that I know are working on it. I know they're working on it in Iowa and in Florida and Louisiana. And so get with your, your state associations, almost all of them come together through the American Trucking Association and, and just know that we here in Texas, myself, John Esparza, our present CEO and others, are here to support you. We're here to, to help guide and advise you through the process. If you need somebody to come up there and testify, just give me a call. I'll, I'll jump on a plane. I mean, we're, we're all in this together and that's the beauty of our industry is it's very collegial. We are all here to help each other while we may be competitors. We're, we're all here fighting the same fight and we can, we can do this and through our cumulative efforts and our cumulative uh, voices at the, at the legislative level, we can do it. Uh, what we did here in Texas is we focused really in two areas. Uh, the first was the fundamental unfairness that we were having in the courtroom, which was uh, what we, uh, I think, solved in a, in a large respect through House Bill 19, but we also have this, these doctor mills that all of, all of these trial lawyers send their, their, uh, these folks to that don't use insurance and they overinflate the medical bills. Our Texas Supreme Court uh, said during last session that we were going to be able to introduce any evidence showing what they actually get paid by insurance companies or Medicare or Medicaid or comp, which was huge uh, for us because uh, as it stood before those two opinions came out, it was really only what those doctors were claiming that they should get paid that was introduced to the juries. And so we fixed that issue through the Texas Supreme Court that had some legislation if anybody's having issues with that. But in terms of House Bill 19, I mean, we were going in the courtroom with our arms tied behind our back. I mean, they would sue us not only for the driver being negligent for the accident, but then they used what are referred to as direct negligence actions against the companies for negligent hiring, negligent trustment, negligent supervision, negligent training, negligent maintenance. And so what we were seeing was if it was a bad accident, then they would make the trial about the accident. But as many of us know on this call, a lot of times they're minor accidents. And so what they would do is, is they would make the whole case about all of the documentation and information they found about the company uh, to use what's referred to as the reptile theory to to instill a sense of fear in these juries that were unsafe companies and regardless of the fact that the accident was was very minor we they need to punish our companies like us and others on the call and so what we did through house bill 19 is we broke the trial into two parts and what what we're going to have in texas now as of uh, september 1st of last year uh, is we can elect to bifurcate the trials, meaning we're going to split them into two parts. And in the first phase of the trial, we're going to talk about what we should be talking about, which is what was the cause of the accident? Who was at fault? And how do we make this person whole? Uh, with, with one exception we can talk about here in just a minute. And then in the second phase of the trial, we're going to talk about 
anything related to the companies that aren't doing the business the right way. You know, they have bad hiring practices. They have bad, uh, you know, they're not following the regulations. We can talk about that, but let's not poison the jury in the first phase in their evaluation of, of who is at fault in the accident and how do we make that person whole. And so I think this is a very good first step uh, in, in this initiative, I think we're going to go into next session, uh, with a few more ideas and we're going to keep, uh, keeping, keeping the fight up and keep taking it to them. Cause as, as everybody on this call knows, the best defense is a good offense and you can rest yeah. assured that I'll be there to lead from the front. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it really it moves us into the kind of the next section of what I want to speak about really well. Right. Uh, in the sense of, you know, you can see my quote on the screen here. This was a quote from Chris Spear, president of the ATA, right? And he said, we're growing very tired as an industry being picked on by plaintiff's bar, right? Uh, you know, pockets of lawyers are being filled at the expense of training jobs. And the last point is what I really want to sit in on, right, is that we need to be in a position to fight. And I think that's the value of having a conversation like what we're having today, right, is that, you know, somewhere in a fancy hotel, there's probably plaintiff's attorneys that are meeting, going over reptile theory, going over this approach that's being taken and saying, hey, if you say X, Y, and Z, you know, it's not hard to paint the picture of the big bad motor carrier, unfortunately, right? Um, we're going to cover kind of what the landscape looks like right now on this next slide here. And I know that many of you on the call are well aware of nuclear verdicts, probably, you know, have heard many things about it. Um, the death By definition, it's anything that's a verdict that's awarded over $10 million. Uh, but I read a stat recently in an ATRI paper that said that between 2010, 2010 and 2018, the average nuclear verdict went from 2.3 million to just under $23 million. And so, you know, as Adam alluded to earlier, this isn't just an issue of, of um, you know, one isolated moment for a carrier, right? This is an issue of scale for the industry. We've got to fight back. We have to do it together, uh, all the way down to you and I's personal insurance, right? Uh, from an insurance perspective, we can't keep supporting $23 million average verdicts uh, and not see one of our top three expenses, which is you know fuel fleet and insurance, right? Increase and see those increases in premiums as well. And so we need to know what the enemy is and we need to know how to fight it. And that's the hope of our call today is that we'd be able to use your time well and really educate you on tangible things you can do to, if you're in Texas, right? To take advantage of this two-phase trial. And if you're not, to prepare your company uh, for the threat that's out there. So well, nuclear... even, even if even if you're not in Texas though, if you if you drive through Texas, right? There's an accident, you're, you're, that case can be tried here, right? It's either going to be where, where you're headquartered or where the accident occurs. And I think it's important to note that, you know, 88% of trucking companies have five or fewer trucks. And so this is not an issue that just impacts the, the large publicly traded companies. It, it impacts mid-sized fleets like mine all the way down to this to the small operations. I mean, we as an industry are the definition of the middle class and an opportunity for individuals out there right that start as a company driver and end up as an owner operator and then a lot of them end up with their own fleets and so we've got to come together to to tackle this this issue throughout the entire country that's absolutely correct you know this 411 million dollar verdict that's listed here was a single truck company you know and you look at someone that's a, a mom and pop company with a million dollar policy this is is a huge impact to their whole life so um you know what is a plaintiff's approach if i am a plaintiff attorney and i'm you know coming after you in a verdict situation typically they're going to take what's called reptilian or reptile theory right and which is basically a fancy word to say hey we're going to take and make an emotional appeal like earlier i said it's not hard to paint the picture of the big bad motor carrier right especially these are typically wrapped around you know accidents and incidents that aren't really pretty right it's an unfortunate part of the industry uh, and so they're going to come in and say hey you know this is the emotional appeal of that because of that we can open the door and what adam's mentioning in the two-phase trial is that we're not really looking, and I say industry-wide, we are, right, states without tort reform. These cases aren't really looking at the applicable driver, the applicable driver files and training and what happened in that isolated incident. It's an open file to corporate record and saying, hey, I'm going to look through years of history, uh, maybe when you weren't even the sitting safety director, right, uh, and say that there's negligence and, and it's easier to paint that picture. And so that's how we move into these huge uh, punitive damages awards that, that we're seeing right now in the industry. The last part of that, right, and, and I want to be careful when I say this, right, but data is not the enemy, but we can no longer live by the idea that, hey, I didn't know about it. You know, we regulated data with ELDs and uh, goodness, I was driving down the road this morning on the way to work and the car in front of me has a camera. I mean, uh, even drive cams aren't regulated. They're very commonplace these days. And so 
uh, it's an industry now where we can no longer, you know, kind of plead the fifth of, oh, I didn't know about it. How do we take all the data that's out there, though, and use it to our advantage so that we're responding consistently, that we've got a solid safety culture in place, and that as a company, we know that we're both nimble enough to act on it quickly, but documenting what we're doing. And so that's what we're going to talk about today as well. I want to move on though to the next slide here and really dive into the point of the conversation today, which is, hey, what is House Bill 19? And Adam, I think you intro that pretty well, right? But the legal definition here would be that it's a legal precedent. Uh, it was established September 2021. And so it's protecting carriers that are defending themselves against lawsuits related to accidents and incidents. And it's doing that in ways that we're going to talk about here. So uh, Adam, anything you'd like to add just really to the definition of what House Bill 19 is? No, I mean, look, House Bill 19 is is very complicated because it's a it's a procedural uh, it, it it impacts the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, which is basically uh, the process of trying the lawsuits. Right, this is a mechanism that that the lawyers that are defending us in these lawsuits is something that they can do to break it into two parts. It is a it allows us as the defendants in these lawsuits to make an election to choose to break the trial into two parts and focus, like I mentioned earlier in the first phase on just the accident. And then in the second phase, which if we're found negligent, it would go to that second phase, which would be for punitive damages. And at that point, they can bring out all of these, you know, our history, uh, so long as that it, it's relevant and, and from an evidentiary standpoint uh, appropriate, but they can bring those things out, but it's not muddying the waters when we're talking about the accident. And that's, I think, the, the significance of it and the change that we made uh, by getting this bill passed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a big issue and we need to be able to break it down and focus on the event at hand. So uh, one thing we really want to make sure we spend time on today, right, is with House Bill 19, again, you mentioned that even if you're you have maybe not Texas based, right, but you've got drivers in Texas, uh, that there is some movement as to where that actually could go to trial. So uh, important for you to know this information today. You can take advantage of it, but we have to comply with certain regulations in order to do that. And so we want to talk through now, you know, what that is, what that looks like for your company, what that looks like for your drivers, uh, and then really how 10th Street can help you to prepare for that as well. So uh, if we go to the next slide here, we're going to kind of see some breakdowns of what the specific regulations are. Uh, and then after, we, I guess before we do that, bifurcation uh, is kind of a term we've thrown out a few times on this call. That is the phase one and phase two. So if we go to phase one, right, and within what the, actually the legal precedent stipulates, right, if we meet those requirements, we will stay in that first phase. And that is what Adam was saying, how do we make this person whole? That's what the fancy name for bifurcation is. So if we go to phase two, then that's when we move into the company as a whole, open it up to corporate record and, and really look at punitive damages. So the next slide here, we will see those specific breakdowns. Awesome. So how do we prevent moving into phase two, right? First one being that, hey, your driver is properly licensed to drive the CMV and in compliance with all endorsements and restrictions. Adam, you want to talk through this from the owner's perspective? Yeah. And so um, a couple of things to, to note as we as we talk about this, um, what, what happened through the legislative process here in Texas was uh, we, we were going, uh, you know, we were it was the trial lawyers that were opposing this bill. And so through the legislative process, you know, we wanted to be able to have two phases no matter what. And like most legislation, there there's negotiations to get it passed. There were concerns by certain legislators here in the state of Texas that were concerned about the fact that we weren't gonna bring in, be able to bring in records about uh, bad companies not uh, operating appropriately and within the regulations that, that were required to to operate under. And, and Long, through through that process, what the trial lawyers want to do is say, look, you've got to comply with every regulation in order to bifurcate the trial. And we said, no, we can't do that because then the exception uh, swallows the rule, right? I mean, they're so we're so heavily regulated. You know, a driver, you know, driving with a, with a tail light out has nothing to do with a, a improper lane departure, right, or or a rear end accident. And so, what we said was we'll agree to allow certain regulations to be introduced in the first phase through a a single uh, direct negligence claim, which would be uh, negligent entrustment, but only for a specific set of regulations. And so by doing that, we still afford ourselves the ability to bifurcate. Um, if we're not complying with certain regulations, they can bring that in 
as evidence in the first phase of the trial, but it's very clear what those regulations are. Because as many of us know in business and safety directors out there is we want clarity and transparency. We need to, we want to know exactly what we have to comply with. And so what, what we did in that process was we said, look, you can, in the first phase, you bring, you know, that direct negligence action for negligent entrustment as well as the driver being negligent. But the only thing that you can claim we, we uh, only thing you can claim to support that direct negligence action for negligent entrustment is these specific regulations. And it's really broken down into two larger groups. One relates to carriers and one relates to, to drivers. And so sure. when I was, when we were sitting there negotiating this bill on the house floor at Dana uh, Moore with the Texas Trucking Association, he's our head regulatory guy. And I said, look, you need to find every regulation we can live with. And, and really those regulations that every good carrier out there complies with. And because right. we're not here to try to absolve ourselves of responsibility when we're at fault, what we're trying to do is, is afford ourselves a fair shot in the courtroom. And so that's what we really did with these regulations is we said, look, these are regulations every company, every good company out there should be complying with and, and most likely are, right? So we're talking about making sure that the driver is as proper CDL, right? That he has his proper endorsements, that he's qualified under the state and federal regulations to to operate a vehicle that that he's either complied with a road test or falls under the exception here in Texas um, of not having to have that if depending on certain endorsements, uh, making sure that they're uh, complying with all of the drug consortiums and drug testing requirements, uh, making sure that that they've submitted to uh, appropriate alcohol tests, you know, uh, drug and alcohol testing and the consortiums were required to making sure they have an application. But some of those, for instance, the application, it's only within two years of employment, right? Because if a driver's been with you for 10 years, whether he turned in an application when you hired him has nothing to do with an accident 10 years down the road. And so I think it's very important for all of our safety directors out there to know that this legislation is not never was intended and, and will not absolve companies that just aren't doing business the right way. It's really to protect all of those out there, which I would represent as most of them in the industry that want to comply and giving us a fair shot. And so what I would tell everybody is, you know, commit these to memory uh, in your safety departments, make sure that you put these regulations up for everybody to ensure that you're complying with them uh, and make sure that your drivers, you know, in, in your companies, whether it's the carrier or the driver themselves uh, are complying with them. And if they're not, you need to take appropriate corrective action to, to provide yourself the opportunity to defend against them in the first phase of the trial. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, um, you're correct in the sense that these are commonplace things, right? That most of the industry wants to do well. One of the hurdles that we face as an industry is that a, there's a lot of churn in, in safety positions, first of all, um, and B, you know, post some of the legislation changes probably back to all the way to 2010, right? A safety director is almost required to be a police officer in many instances, right? And so there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of, of you know, things to be followed through on, uh, and that leaves place for risk in the industry, even amongst people that are, you know, incredibly diligent at their job and do an amazing job at it. Uh, and so when you break these down specifically, and you'll see we've got a handout here as well, uh, but I want to take a second and really just kind of talk through, you know, what is carrier responsibility, what is driver, and then how can 10th Street help with that as well. Um, so the first section that we looked at, right, is your driver properly licensed to drive the CMV? Are they in compliance with all restrictions and endorsements? Endorsements and restrictions, right? Um, you know that is data that we're aiming to capture initially through the Intel app. And so when you have a driver apply, it's going to autofill for them, right? And it's storing those pieces of information. You're getting endorsements. You're getting restrictions. Additionally, right, once that's reported to you, we've got existing integrations with the leading CRA vendors as well. So you can run a SID list. You can run, um, you know, your MVR and confirm and verify these things as well. I know you're doing this, but, you know, part of what's uh, the hurdle that we're overcoming is that we can no longer be fragmented in our approach here, right? We've got to have an interconnected system. We can't have data across four to seven different places uh, in order to make sure that we're, you know, meeting those metrics and maintaining that compliance. Yeah. Uh, the second, go ahead, Adam. Well, I mean, look, I think all of us that have been on this call, especially those that have been in the industry for many years now, realize that, you know, we, before the electronic logging device mandate, you know, we, we were not exactly an industry that that was at the forefront of technology. I mean, we've always been, you know, 
trying to make ourselves better as companies, make, making the roads safer for the motoring public. But we have been a group that has, you know, been at the forefront of technology. And I think after the ELD mandate, we, we have seen a huge proliferation of technology in our industry. And I think uh, all for the positive. Um, but with that has come so much data that's coming into our safety departments, whether it is, you know, data from our electronic logging devices, whether it's cameras, whether it's, you know, wh whatever aspect that is, we as companies, we as, as safety departments have to make sure that we're utilizing these to the best of, of, of our companies and, and as, as best we can, but we've got to accumulate that data in a way that we're not overlooking it. And I think that's what's important is, you know, how do we filter that in through some medium, whether it's, you know, platforms like yours or others, it's affording us the ability to bring that into one place to afford ourselves the best ability within our safety departments and providing the resources for our employees within those departments to to not only receive that data, but be able to analyze it on a regular basis and ensure that it's not something that's going to be used against us. Because that's the problem is with so much data, if it's not overlooked and maintained, you're, it's almost more of a curse than it is a blessing. And so we've got to make sure that we're continuing to be vigilant yeah. about that. That's absolutely correct. And that's what I most commonly hear on the call with carriers, right? Is that, you know, you know how often do you check X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, and it's overwhelming in the sense that it's coming through and it's not stopped, right? You're going to get daily pushes. You're going to get daily updates. Um, and how do we document that we are following up on that data? How do we show that paper trail of coaching, right? And I think this, this idea of training is also, in some senses, losing its validity that we really have to coach a driver right we can't just send a course we need to send it and and there's immense value in sending it with automation right but if we're doing that then we can reach out to them and say hey did you have questions about this we can document those coaching sessions and those coaching notes and show that to your point right it's not our enemy because if we don't do something with it then you can guarantee that you know when we are in a situation like this that they will find a way to use that data against us and it won't be in our favor. So um, you know, there's there's lots of other ways on this sheet. I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly here, but in terms of your driver being disqualified from operating a CMV, right? That the DOT long form app, that is what's captured through the Intel app. And so we're gonna see driver history, employment history, previous disqualifications, and they speak to the FMCSRs on there as well. Um, when it comes to, hey, has your driver completed that road test? I know there's instances where that is and is not applicable in Texas, uh, but we can store those files in our system. So certificate of road test completion, you know, being able to upload that, there is a, and a lot of value as well and being a single platform for that. So from candidate and driver perspective, they can use the driver Pulse app to share those documents with you. And you can make sure that you've got those in their DQ file as well. Does your driver have a current medical examination certificate, right? Yes, we can capture those through the Pulse app. They can send it in. And again, that's an, a metric that's being tracked through our enhanced DQF tool. And we're going to alert you if that document is either expired or not there. Uh, the next one down is, hey, is your driver prohibited from operating the CMV under Part 382 or Part 395, right? Pulse MD is going to be a huge player there. We have integrations with a lot of the leading uh, vendors for chain of custody testing, for physicals. Uh, and so you can actually, again, out of one platform, as you're hiring the candidate, choose to go ahead and run that test. It sends a barcode to their phone through the Pulse app. The driver walks in, scans it. It's a full electronic chain of custody process, and it will result back for you to be tracked as well. Along with that, the forms capture allows you to be able to send out those documents that would be required as well. So when it comes to hours of service, you know, those can be captured in a forms met methodology or actually with our telematics integration. So if you have an integration with, you know, Keep Trucking or Lytics or Omnitrax, you name it, right, any of these vendors out there, then we can bring in those feeds with our preferred integrations and show hours of service data and show if there's, you know, changes or any kind of triggering event in that data as well. The next one down says your driver submitted an application for employment, right? I hope you have an application. I've been on many, many calls where someone's come into the role and said, hey, we don't have these preceding many years. And I know we go back two years with House Bill 19 uh, and, and check that there as well. Uh, but do you need an app? Yes, you can send that to your driver. And you know, with the Intella app and the autofill functionality, it's an easy process. They can do it on their phone in around two to five minutes. Your driver has not refused or failed a required drug or alcohol test. This is going to be, um, you know, really a, a valid 
area of focus for you, especially with the clearinghouse, right? And so we are a TPA, we're a third party for the clearinghouse. You can run those queries through us. You can run the limited queries in bulk. Uh, and if you are not doing that now, certainly reach out to your advisor and ask about it. We had a question in the chat that says, hey, will the clearinghouse wipe out the employment verifications? When this was released, we actually said that it's gonna be you know, three years after the original date of deploying the clearinghouse that those changes would come. So we're not quite there yet, um, but we are a TPA. We can go ahead and run those queries and that's gonna meet that requirement for you there. Your driver is not under an out-of-service order. So there's a lot of reasons, right, that a driver could be under an out-of-service order. Uh, and really, when you look at 10th Street, again, it's this idea that there is everything in one spot, it's interconnected, it's not fragmented, and it's working together in your favor. So we've got the clearinghouse integration, we've got the forms that we capture, we're tracking those documents, we are, you know, working with those leading CRAs, and we also offer, uh, through some integrations, our MVR monitoring. So if there is changes in those, you know, MVRs, if the driver's put on suspension or anything like that, we're going to alert you out of one platform as well. So lots of ways that 10 Street can help. I would highly encourage you to download that uh, handout before we leave the call here today uh, and just be able to have a quick snapshot on your desk, right? What am I responsible for? How do I take advantage of the bill? Uh, and how can 10 Street help with that? I want to move now, Adam, and hear from you uh, from a carrier's perspective, right? What can I expect if I don't meet one of these metrics or if I move into a phase two portion of the trial and or, right, if I'm not in Texas or driving in Texas and going through a trial, what does this look like for me? So what would this, this phase two portion look like? So, like I'd mentioned before, the, the, the violations of these regulations will be able to be introduced in the first phase. So, it's very critical that all of the safety departments out there, all the, the carriers that are on the call, uh, commit these to memory, make sure that you're, you're complying with, with these, which I would, I would imagine that substantially everybody is. So, you know, commit these to memory so you're not putting yourself in a position to have that negligent trustment claim included in the first phase. Uh, in terms of the second phase of the trial, um, making sure that our fleets are operating uh, appropriately, that we're not driving negligently on the road is, is obviously the first, the, the best first step to prevent that second phase. Because if you're not found negligent in the first phase, you're not going to go to the second phase of the trial, which is going to be for punitive damages. Uh, in terms of, of how do you put yourself in the best position to, uh, you know, withstand that second phase if you if you are found negligent in the first phase. Uh, I, at the end of the day, it's ultimately just staying vigilant uh, to your safety culture within your organization. I mean, we as a company have known from the very beginning that uh, in business, it's easy to cut corners. But when you start doing that, it's it's the fastest way to, to go under. Right. And I think when you're looking at trucking companies, the the foundation of all of our companies has to be within within our safety departments and giving them the, the freedom to to make the call to to be able to continue that culture uh, within the, the drivers and, and operating together with our, our dispatch department because there's always a some give and take there right and so we've got to make sure that we're complying with regulations that if we have drivers that are not complying with those regulations that we're following the handbooks that we all uh, have to ensure that they were taking the appropriate corrective actions and unfortunately sometimes you got to let a driver go right and that's always hard because we've got a driver shortage right now but make sure that you're you're doing business the right way and that's the best way to ensure that you're not going to get hit with the big nuclear verdict um, in that second phase and we're going to continue to keep the fight up here in texas to continue to bring those down and i think the the advertising we're seeing here in Texas is probably a good first step. And then I think we're going to start seeing the factoring and these finance companies coming in, uh, investing in lawsuits. We've got to tackle that issue next. But just keep your safety culture strong and support your safety departments. And if you need resources from the ownership, if you're in safety, just make sure you reach out and ask for that. Because I know that's what we're all looking for as owners is to continue to provide those resources to make everybody successful. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm curious as an owner, right? What is your biggest concern when you go to bed at night in terms of safety for your company? The the biggest concern has always been that something could happen the next day and we're not in business anymore with these yeah. with these types of nuclear verdicts. I mean, you're always at risk. And I think when you or somebody like myself, I know how it feels to feel like you can't make payroll, right? And I know that it's the folks within our organization that have built our company. And I got to make sure that I put food not only on my family's table, but the 150 people that depend on us, right? And so 
my concern has always been making sure we're complying with hours of service, making sure that our trucks are out there on the road operating safely for our motoring publics, and that if there is, you know, some uh, an accident that occurs that's outside of our control, that we're in the best position to be able to to defend what will very likely be a, a, a lawsuit in the future. And so I think that we've got to make sure that, you know, we're providing trailer pools like we do to allow our drivers to operate uh, within their hours of service. I know that everybody needs to stay very vigilant about the personal conveyance uh, on the ELDs because that can be taken advantage of. And I would encourage anybody that's in a safety department or anybody that's the owner of a company out there to make sure that you're keeping a close eye on personal conveyance because, you know, that is has a very limited and in, uh, intended use. And if we're not keeping an eye on that, it can be taken advantage of. And so those are a few things. I think we've got to utilize technology, but we've got to do it in a way that doesn't be, make it a greater risk factor for us as companies. I mean, there's so much data coming in. You're not obligated to have cameras right now, for instance, but if you're going to have them and it's going to stream that information back to you as a safety department, if you use uh, platforms that provide, you know, information to your safety departments uh, related to driving out there, make sure you're keeping an eye on it because that's a self-imposed duty is what I call it. And if we're not keeping an eye on those things, they're certainly going to use it against us. And so evaluate your staffing and, and what you have within your safety departments and make sure you have enough folks that can keep an eye on all these things because it, it can be a, a curse as much as a blessing if you're not on top of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to look at that in a second here as well. So how do we follow up on this? How do we track that data? Um, but before we do that, there's a few questions I'd love to ask you about. So there's several surrounding ELDT and how that's going to affect um, verdicts and what we see in the industry and mentorship. Is there anything that you'd like to add on that topic? Um, I mean, in terms of the, the ELDs, I, I think that <clears throat> the information that we're receiving from those is great. And I think that we're going to continue to see this evolution of technology in our industry. I think we're seeing more, you know, trucks, for instance, that are automatics instead of these manuals. And I think that the, the conditions in the cab are going to get better. We're going to see what, uh, you know, autonomy brings. I don't see autonomy as something that's going to take over where we have driverless vehicles, but I think it's certainly going to provide an opportunity for our drivers to operate more safely. I think having mentors and the ability to get these 18 to 21 year olds into our industry is critical for our driver shortage, but we need to make sure that we're putting them in trucks that that provide them the best ability to operate safely on our roads with you know automatic braking and lane departure notifications and crash avoidance mitigation systems and, and the camera systems that we all have and and just providing those individuals coming in with the best possible opportunity to succeed and, and making sure we keep our motor and public safe all at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um I'm curious before we ask this next question here, somebody asked about insurance regulation or not insurance regulations, but premiums and how this would affect it, right? Is if we see, you know, improvement over time because of things like House Bill 19 and because of things like the entry level driver training programs. And so, um, you know, a lot of what I do at 10th Street as well is speaking to insurance companies. And what's funny, and I maybe shouldn't say funny, but unique about this is that really the way a plaintiff attorney looks at your company in a verdict situation, not all that different than the way an underwriter looks at your company to write a policy in terms of risk. And so as we're talking through, you know, some of these things that we can do, um, you know, are we meeting these regulations at a minimum, right? So that we avoid a phase two, right? Um, you know, Adam mentioned handbooks. How consistently do we follow what's in company policy and how do we track that as a company, right? If I'm looking for incidents or recurrence of certain types of behaviors and my company policy says, three over speeds of X miles an hour over and you're immediately terminated and I don't follow through on that and I move to a phase two of a trial, it's not hard to say, hey, they don't even follow the policy that they wrote, right? How are they going to follow the regulations of the FMCSA? And so these are the kind of things that 10th Street wants to help with, with tracking for incidents and monitoring driver performance and showing you kind of that trending data there. Um, but long term, right? one would hope that we see improvement there because if we're getting a handle on our driver performance and if we're constantly training and coaching and educating our fleet right these should be investments that we're making that we see not only in insurance rates right because we can show the insurer hey this is what i do i've got a an automated system in place and you really won't find anything else that automates follow-up and coaching 
like 10 Street in the industry right now. And so I've got an automated system in place. I'm able to track and, and document what I'm doing. The insurer's going to love that, right? And you should see the improvement in ISS scores, you know, over time. I don't want to say that, you know, all of a sudden you're going to see improvements in your premiums, right? But over time, you should see safer drivers on the road for your company. And, and hopefully that's reflective of your premiums. Additionally, right, retention has a huge impact there as well. If you continue to work to keep safe drivers and, and create an atmosphere of your company that respects and appreciates safety, right, the drivers that should be there and are driving safely are going to thrive in that environment. And so, um, you know, it's a long-term game that we're playing, right, but there should be many areas that we see improvement there. We had another great question I want to ask you, Adam. It was, hey, we're 180 days since this became law. Do you know of any cases where the defendant has actually requested bifurcation? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing it in almost all our cases now. I mean, I don't, I don't practice anymore, so I, I don't know for certain, but I know, I know we're, we're starting to see them utilize this. We're starting to see uh, a lot of gains by our ability to introduce uh, evidence about the overinflated medical billing um, environment that we've seen for many, many years. I mean, the nuclear verdicts, which is what House Bill 19 was intended to really tackle, um, while those are significant, it, it's really the overinflated medical billing practices we're seeing as kind of the death of a thousand razor blade cuts, right? I mean, that's what's killing us day in and day out on these claims. And a lot of people ask me after they said, oh, Adam, how's this going to impact anything? You know what? I don't see how this is going to provide some relief. Well, he, here's what we have to understand is that insurance companies are, are determining our premiums based on the amount of payouts for claims for not only us, but everybody else that they insure in, in the standard markets. And right. two major issues we were having here in Texas were, A, there were fewer and fewer insurance companies willing to insure trucking companies like ours. And so we saw a lot of insurance companies leaving the market. And when you have fewer insurance companies willing to write these policies, then there's less competition. And when there's less competition, you're going to naturally see increases in the rates. And I think that increases, the increases we were seeing in the rates was because of this, the settlement values were continuing to go up and up and up and, and the payouts on these claims were going up. And an issue that, that I identified early on and what I think House Bill 19 is going to help us with substantially is that insurance companies weren't trying cases in Texas because there was really no winning. When they were going right. to the courtroom, when they're evaluating risk, right, which is what they do through their actuaries and their their statistic, you know, they're 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 the smart folks that run numbers, uh, right? Yep. And, and all their statistical analysis of these cases was that there's there's too much risk to go try them. Well, now we have given them the opportunity to go try them because we're giving them a fair shot in the courtroom. And I think what we've got to do now is we have to demand that they go try the good cases. I mean, those little cases where you know, there's minor damage or, you know, somebody's running into us and, and they still bring these lawsuits, we've got to take them to the mat. I mean, we have to demand that our insurance companies go start trying and trying cases because I know there were several carriers here in Texas that they hadn't tried cases in years and all the settlement amount is, right, what we're willing to pay out in a settlement is, is simply a, a best guess of what we would expect to have to pay out at trial, you know, including the cost of trying it. And so now that we have the ability to go try these cases, we have to do that. And when we go try them, we're going to see verdicts start coming down, which I think is going to naturally result in our premiums coming down, but it's also going to afford us the ability to have more insurance carriers coming into this market. And so we've got to focus on those two things. And I think we'll see more, more people willing to write insurance in Texas. And we're going to see settlement values starting to go down and verdicts start going down, which should translate to lower premiums for us. And again, if you're not in Texas, right, that is key and, and paramount because you are exactly right. Insurers are leaving. They are not wanting to, to stay in this market space. Uh, and we'd be remiss to not think that this literally trickles down to the insurance that I pay on my personal vehicle, right? Uh, they cannot keep sustaining claims of this level and not pass on that burden to the members. And so that's what we're seeing. That's the threat we're facing. And if they never go fight it, right, then it's just an unending battle. And so it's it's a big cycle we're facing. Yeah, we look at the excess li liability markets, right? I mean, I we don't have excess. Um, we just have our, our first million. And the problem that we're seeing with all of these claims and the rising value and cost of these claims, just even regular claims, where they're forcing us to bring in um, you know, our umbrella policies into these claims is causing those those rates to go up as well, which is making our roads less safe. 
And that's what I was explaining to the legislature last session was, you know, I'm a mid-sized company. I pay a million dollars in insurance every year and, and the 20% increase is $200,000. And for an industry that pays, you know, that has three to 5% profit margins, that's unsustainable. And I would love to have excess liability coverage, right, on, on our auto, but we can't afford it because it's, it's the pricing of it. The cost is almost the same as, as, as the first layer that we have on our auto. And so we need to bring these down and put ourselves in a position where we don't have to bring in our excess liability carriers on these claims because that's just creating a, a higher cost and, and higher payouts on these settlements. And that's something we've got to stay very vigilant of. Absolutely correct. I mean, it's we're pricing ourselves out of the of the industry at this point, and so um, to either the that question, or a gallon of milk is going to cost twelve bucks. That's what I told him. I said I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of folks left that are going to be able to to haul all the milk. But if you want a gallon of milk to cost twelve dollars, then then don't fix these problems. I mean, everything well, tough has been on a truck. It, that's exactly correct. And after after the last couple of years, I mean, if you didn't think a trucker before, you for sure are going to do it now. So, um, you know, a couple of questions and then we'd love to open it up for any more that are out there. Uh, if we are in a verdict situation of any type, right, who are they going to call to the stand? And it, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Explain it to me a little so, bit more. You know, I, I think the common misconception is that, oh, it's, you know, X, Y, Z that could be called to the stand. If we move into like a phase two, right? And, and you know, safety is going to be obviously someone that's going to have to speak for the company, right? Mm -hmm. But is it just safety's is burden alone or will we see recruiting managers and other members that could be brought in for negligent hiring? I mean, what does that look like? Where does the threat lie for the motor carrier? Well, I think the first thing is, is we're going to avoid a lot of those people having to come in in the first phase, right? As long as we're complying with these regulations, we're going to go in with a fair playing field in the first phase of the trial. And hopefully we're going to start getting some, some defense verdicts, meaning that we're winning a trial. And if we, sure. if that, if that's what happens, then you have a lot of people that don't have to come in. If you right. get into the second phase, um, I, I think it's going to be the same folks you're seeing now, right? And I think that, you know, through the advent of technology, for instance, we use a platform that does safety training videos for our drivers every couple of weeks. And we're putting ourselves in a position now with technology, as long as we utilize it uh, correctly and we're monitoring it correctly, we're in a heck of a lot better position uh, from, a def from a defensive standpoint of going in there and saying, look, we're, we're not an unsafe carrier. We're not somebody you should be afraid of on the road. In fact, we're doing more than we should and we're going above and beyond. And I think that's the beauty of technology when it's used appropriately and we have platforms similar to 10th Street and others that provide ourselves the ability to accumulate that all in one, one spot. And we can then go in there to those trials and say, look, no, this is not only are we doing it the right way, we're going above and beyond. We, we manage it all through this platform. You know, we're monitoring the, the, the forward facing cameras that we have, even driver facing. If you have those, we're utilizing technology videos that we're sending out every couple of weeks. That's the best way to defend yourself is doing it the right way, but also having it in a way that you can translate that information to a jury. And I tell my safety department all the time, you know, understand that anything you do, you better be prepared to sit in front of 12 people in a box and have all this up on a, on a projector screen in a courtroom. And I think as long as you kind of take that mindset to it, then we're all going to be in a lot better position uh, when we get into the courtrooms. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there was a question on cost of cameras and, and just concern of adding those versus the worth of, of having them, right? I want to know from you, what is the cost of not having them? That, that's the great debate right now, right? Um, you know, I call them, I call a lot of these things self-imposed duties, right? We have no regulatory or legal obligation to utilize cameras in our trucks right now, right? I mean, the, so that begs the question, should we have them? And we've had a lot of those debates internally because when you start looking at cameras and the cost of cameras and the cost of the back end platforms on a per driver basis, that gets expensive. And so I think at least I'll speak for me. Uh, when we evaluated this, we said, look, we do think we need cameras. Uh, we need cameras because you're seeing more and more frivolous lawsuits out there of in accidents where we were not at fault, but when it's a he said, she said situation, what do you have to defend yourself? You know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And we have, you know, a RICO criminal indictment in Louisiana for a sw swoop and squat uh, operation out there. So I think cameras are important. I think they're important to have, especially forward facing. And I am of the opinion that you need to have them down the sides of your truck as well, because when we started evaluating this just forward facing there's a lot of stuff that happens around the truck prior to what occurs in front of it that gives a better picture of what's happening sure. and so i would uh, that's just 
Adam Blanchard speaking personally. Uh, the, the second thing is cost. And, you know, I'm of the opinion that, you know, we want to have an in-cab recorder that's going to provide information to us. But uh, the, the cost of all the additional back-end platforms is not something we've utilized today just because of the incredible amount of personnel it's going to take to continue to monitor those, although there's Netrodyne and other systems out there that will alert you of certain things. So I think you have to look at it from a cost and size perspective for your company, but I think that not having cameras, you're putting yourself at pretty substantial risk of not having very clear video and photos of exactly what happened, which does put you at a disadvantage of the day in and day out claims, especially in the nuclear verdicts as well, because you need to be able to show those jurors exactly what happened and why it happened to help put yourself in a position to defend those lawsuits. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, um, it's also a unique instance, right, where in many states, negligence and liability aren't going to link up. So you might be determined, you know, 15% negligent or 20% negligent for the accident, right? Uh, but 100% financially responsible for the liability. And so when you become um, in that situation where it's it's he said, she said, and really what happened, right? We want to make sure that we can prove that, you know, there is no negligence and and the X, Y, Z event. And if you don't have the footage of that, um, again, how's that going to stand? So certainly a, a balance to juggle in terms of cost and value, but um you know, the one of the things that kind of hits me is if there's a bunch, and I don't have one in my car, I'll admit it, but if there's a bunch of, you know, personal citizens out there driving their vehicle with cameras in it, right? Um, if I'm the trucking company owner, I sure want them in my trucks. So I don't want to be playing the defense, yeah. not, not be proactive there. I think so. And I think it's just to me, you, you have we have it available. Find it, find it, find the system that works best for you. And I think there's two systems out there, right? You can either have cameras in your trucks with a onboard recording device with a SD card, right, that you can pull at any point, or you can utilize a system that, that sends that back to your company uh, via 3G uh, or Wi-Fi. And, and I think both are great. It's just a matter of personnel and staffing and, and to what level you want to utilize it and how you're going to use it as well through driver training. Uh, throughout the course of, of, you know, the time that these drivers are with you. But I think not having it, you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage because we're seeing so many frivolous lawsuits now that we've got to have the, the, this evidence out there that helps us defend these lawsuits. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another quick question. How long after an accident occurs can a lawsuit be filed against the trucking company? So that depends about, depends on the state. So every state is going to have what's called a statute of limitations. So whether it's breach of contract or negligent driving or a crime, right? Um, th there is always a statute of limitations, meaning that is the period of time uh, that somebody can bring a lawsuit against you from the date of the accident. Uh, the criminal side is probably an unfair analogy because like there's certain major crimes out there that don't have a statute of limitations, right? But from a civil standpoint, uh, in Texas, it's two years. Uh, bridge contract, for instance, is four, but that's going to vary state by state and something that your insurance company will know about. Um, what I would say is that if there is an accident that you one of your drivers has had, you need to notify your insurance company immediately because you need to put them on notice because if policies turn over every year. And so if your insurance company isn't on notice of the accident, then you can get jammed up on your coverage. So if you know of an accident, just go ahead and let your insurance company know. I know that puts it on your loss runs. I know how that impacts premiums on insurance renewals, but there's a whole lot of risk of not notifying your carrier about it. Um, but in Texas, it's two years and sometimes they'll wait to the very last day to do it. But it, at least if you put your insurance company on notice and you start taking proactive steps, I think a good way to do it is go try to resolve those without a lawsuit or a trial lawyer, right? I mean, you, you, if we tore up their truck and we're at fault, like go get them a new truck, you know, paying for their days off, you know, force your insurance company through their adjusters to make them whole before you get a trial lawyer involved because these trial lawyers make 50 per 40, 50 percent on these cases. They're going to they're going to naturally overinflate the cost of them. So there, I think we can go resolve these things quickly, whether it's within our safety departments, if you're self-insured uh, specifically, but let them know and try to get it resolved before you get jammed up in a big lawsuit. Absolutely. Great advice there. Adam, thank you. We've covered a lot of different topics today. Um, kind of heavy, not going to lie, but it is what it is. Uh, you know, before we hop off, I want to let you know, uh, if you have not seen 10 Street Safety Management Suite, uh, you certainly need to, to reach out to your advisor, to myself, to somebody. Uh, what we have done is really taken the same interconnected process that we've got with recruiting, 
said, hey, there's four to seven different places that you get this data across CSA, telematics, drive cams, accidents and incidents reporting, right? We put it all into one platform, married it with automation, um, helped so that we can track for coaching, manage claims, accidents and incidents, really in unique ways that we are just not seeing in the industry where everything is interconnected, uh, works together and we kind of get rid of this modular fragmented approach, right? So we'd love to take a time to talk with you about that. You've got my contact info right here. Uh, if you don't have an advisor, reach out to me. If you uh, need me to connect you to the right person, I'll certainly do that. Um, and I want to mention as well that we do have our user conference coming up. So if you have not registered for that, uh, feel free to hop on our website. You can go register for the user conference in April. Uh, that'll be in Las Vegas. Uh, certainly a good time and a lot of new information coming out there as well. Any questions that you all have, feel free to send them in. I would love to respond to them or get you to the right person to get an answer. Uh, and and they, can Adam, reach, they can reach out to me too, Josh. I mean, you feel free yes. to share my cell number with them. Uh, shoot me a text or give me a call. I'm happy to help. And I, to let everybody know as well, if you do have an accident in Texas and you are utilizing this, this new legislation that we passed and, and you know, you end up in trial where the, the judge doesn't follow it or there's any kind of an appeal there. Texans for Lawsuit Reform is there to support us in this initiative. And they do a great job of not only helping us pass legislation important to our industry on the tort reform front, but also is there to file amicus briefs and help on appeal. So make sure, especially large carriers out there that are on this, that if, if you do get jammed up on, on House Bill 19 at the trial level by trying cases or insurance carriers out there, utilize Texas for Lawsuit Reform as, as a resource for you to help you on the appeals because they're that's what they're there to do. And I'm here to help in any way. And if your state associations would like to talk to me or John Spars or reach out anytime, you can contact Josh and he'll give you my cell number. So I appreciate you letting me come on today. And everybody keep fighting the good fight. We're going to keep it going here in Texas. And I, I look forward to seeing this permeate throughout the country. Absolutely, Adam. Yeah, if, you, if you're sitting at home and you're like, man, I'm fired up now. How do we get this going? Reach out to your state association. I have personally talked to many of them, and I know that they are they're trying to fight the good fight and make changes uh, and across not just four states in the U.S., right? And we can do better, and we know we will. So uh, reach out, get involved, make sure that we can make our voices heard. If you've got any questions, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. We'd love to connect. Uh, and thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Okay. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good one. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh and Adam. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, and you will receive a recording of this in your email in 24 hours, along with the slides and the handout with all the information on House Bill 19. So thank you again for being here with us. You bet. And feel free to send my, my number out to folks, too, uh, when you send it out to other people. You send them my 210-664-6787 number out to them. Tell them to call me or text me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Everyone have Thanks, a great day. Good to see you, brother. Have a good day. See ya.